Like there's a reason they've kept us from getting married. Why it's in the best interest of the powers that be to see black men and black women be the most unmarried group of people in this country. It's dark as obsidian and it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun. The salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The plug that doesn't need a plug. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again for those who need to hear it. The black woman is God. Let me say it again. The black woman is God. You in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. Welcome to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo. Listen up. Listen up. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the original wireless woman. And welcome back to my spot, room 303. If you are new, welcome to my crew. But my returnees, you know what we do. If you like this video, well then like this video. Let the comments reveal how you and if you're feeling a vibe, go ahead on and subscribe. But before you click, share this link. Welcome, Wi-Fi's, to my generational wealth hack episode of The Wireless Woman. Today, we will be talking about little known secrets that have been kept from us when it comes to how to acquire and maintain generational wealth. So, before we get into today's content, you already know what time it is. It is time to call the bro. So, I need all of my Wi-Fi's to the front of the class. It is time to read aloud. All right. So, welcome to this episode of The Wireless Woman on your way in, make sure you do me a favor and go ahead and like this video. Why? Because when you like it, well, I love it. So today I am going to go ahead and announce the winners from the new subscriber drawing. There were three and those three are Letitia Whitley, Dazelle Matthews, and Chris Atkinson. So if you three could go ahead and send me an email at admin at the wirelesswoman.com so that I can get your email address and be able to send you out your prizes, what you have won. I would greatly appreciate that. All right, channel announcements for all of my Wi-Fi's. Make sure you like comment and subscribe also share this video and check my description box for ways to support my channel and links on any of the information that I've talked about today today we are going to be talking about the American tax code so definitely check the description box because there is going to be information linked below all right, so America is a very interesting place to live. Unless you've lived somewhere else, you wouldn't necessarily know how our laws are codified into certain rules that favor certain classes of people over other people. That's what the Constitution originally was. I mean, even though they said all men were created equal, 
not the men that were three fifths of a man, because those men were clearly not equal, but our laws have been codified from that particular time until today to favor certain groups of people over others. And so for a long time, the ability to marry was denied to blacks and slaves. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? Clearly, strong, stable marriages would have been in the best interest of a slave owner. You get to have, you know, these intact families that are producing children for you, creating stability. So it becomes a little bit counterproductive to think of tearing families apart and having buck males that have more than one set of families. Like, how does this produce a slave class that's really going to be conducive to the work that you need done, especially when you consider that a lot of skilled tradesmen were able to pass on those particular skills to the younger slaves if you keep family groups, community groups intact. But of course, that became problematic over time because of slave rebellions and slave revolts. It became a lot easier to keep the black family destabilized, decentralized. For a long time, even after slavery was abolished, there were these rules in place about who people could marry. You know, for a long time, people couldn't marry interracially. And the reason why these marriage laws were so important is because marriage is directly linked to wealth, wealth management, generational wealth. It is a wealth vehicle, just like buying a house, having land, annuities, credit, art, watches, things that appreciate with value are things that are going to be part of a protected class. So you have to ask yourself the question, why would they guard, protect marriage so vehemently If it's really this arbitrary decision that you make, you know, I just married this person because I love them. You don't see that same type of marriage dynamic amongst the wealthy classes. Oftentimes, matches are made for the purpose of adding land or property or wealth to certain families and in the interest of preserving it. We've seen that all the way since historical times in Europe where royal families would actually inbreed just for the sake of keeping wealth within one particular family. Because wealth is power, whenever you're looking into power dynamics, you're going to also be looking to construct marriages, marriage laws, and all type of governances around marriage that are going to destabilize certain populations and then grow wealth in other populations. And so is it any wonder that Black people are one of the most unmarried groups of people and that we're also increasingly lagging behind other culture groups when it comes to wealth management and generational wealth stability. Like there are two dynamics I really see going on in the black community that are causing a lot of strain on the mean median income of black people. One is being heavily unmarried and two is being married outside of the race. Um, Whenever you start to marry outside of your community, it's going to create wealth pockets that are being siphoned into other racial communities. Now, I myself have been in an interracial marriage. I myself have biracial children. So what I'm saying could come off hypocritical. And the one thing that I'm never afraid of is contradicting myself. However, I do believe that the generational wealth in this nation is passed along by the men I mean, we are in a patriarchy. We're still in that. We're still in a country who has its basis in racism and patriarchy. So 
women have not generationally been the ones to carry wealth forward. And so for that reason, you know, I look a little bit differently on wealth management when it comes to interracial marriages and relationships in that respect, because a black woman marrying out brings wealth into the community, whereas a black man marrying out siphons wealth out of the community. It's unfair. I know I don't make the rules. However, and these things are just based on regular gender norms. I know we're working on gender pay gaps and all that different stuff, but until women are making equal pay for the equal amount of work that men do, unfortunately, the onus of of building, sustaining, and maintaining general wealth is on the men of any culture. For those of us who are moving into upwardly mobile, wealthy classes, I say wealthy because there really aren't a lot of Black people in the wealth market. Rich, sure. Wealthy, not so much. Even those of us who are making a good, you know, a significantly good life for ourselves because of these cultural dynamics, it's highly unlikely that a lot of us will be leaving generational wealth, like wealth machines that continue, institutions that continue from generation to generation and will continue to make money for the beneficiaries thereof. For those Black men, like I said, I I love to add Black women as being generational wealth contributors, sure, but builders and sustainers to that group. But unfortunately, it's going to have to be the men that are really going to make that significant shift in the culture and in these dynamics because the patriarchy is really not going to allow women to be able to make the strides from generation to generation that our men could potentially make. But going back to what I was saying, that dusty ass dynamic of spending more than what you make, being in transient relationships, like I said, it is value systems that are keeping us from keeping up with other wealthy classes. You know, that's the reason why we're continuing the slide from 200 all the way back to 238% in the wealth gap in just two years. Like these are not the conversations that we're having on social media. We're still talking about desirability and, you know, what waist to hip ratio you need to have in order to be looked at as being a viable partner, like as if, you know, we're being chosen by cavemen for what we can contribute to our culture and our society. But when you put those things aside and actually look at what's happening in the Black community, economically, you've got to be kind of concerned with where we are in our relationship dynamics. I think that's why there's such a huge focus on keeping us separated and in competition with each other. Because if we actually collaborated at this time in history, you know, like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you had a lot of black male, black female collaboration with no wealth, you know, with no ability to really push those agendas forward forward, we were actually working together simply because there weren't enough resources in the community for us to to be divisive and to be divided against each other. We had to pool resources in order to just survive. But now that we've moved past survival mode into thriving mode, we find ourselves plagued with certain, like I said, cultural bias that's really keeping us from getting wealthy and staying that way. So today we're going to be talking about the marriage tax and a generational wealth hack because the reason why marriage has been so heavily guarded in this country, I mean, you have to have a marriage license to get married. You have to be licensed to marry, you know, and when you think about anything that you have to be licensed to do, like driving, you don't even have to be licensed per se to vote, even though (laughs) it's coming, it's coming. I think that, um, you know, anything you have to be licensed 
to do should probably require a little bit of training, a little bit of insight. It can't be just a purely emotional decision to marry when there are this many laws that are connected to that one facet of American life. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have like some CPAs and some tax professionals that, you know, could probably eat what I'm saying alive, but that's not the intention that I'm putting this out for. This does not take the place of professional advice. It is just a way for us as black people to look at the choices that we make on how we how we do life together in an attempt to try and like I said, hack the American system and close this generational wealth gap. Everybody else is committed to seeing us do it. I see initiatives from J.P. Morgan Chase, from Goldman Sachs, all these initiatives on the part of generationally wealthy white people to try to spread, or so they say, generational wealth into our community like they're looking for pipelines of how to get it in here but just like how the black dollar only circulates about two times before it leaves our community really the only thing that they're putting that money into our community for is to be able to funnel it right back out to white institutions we're like money launderers for white institutions we just wash their money and give it right back basically and then they can say hey we did good things with our money i guess i don't know i don't i don't know what the whole end game is on it. But I know that if we don't become a group of people like the Hispanics that can flip a dollar at least seven times before it leaves their community or the Asians who can flip a dollar 11 to 12 times before it ever even leaves their community, all of this stuff. If somebody just walked up to us and gave us the handout that everybody says we need, the reparations that everyone says we need and deserve without institutions, it's totally pointless. So marriage is one of those institutions. When we talk about institutions like hospitals, schools, you know, anytime you go into a community that is dominated by a certain cultural group, like when I went to New York and you go to the um, Hasidic Jewish communities, you know, you go to Chinatown, Little Italy. Why can't I say that? Little Italy, Little Italy when you go to these parts of the city, you will see that the hospitals, the schools, the grocery stores, all of these things are dominated by that particular culture. So in order for us to be able to have institutions on a broad scale, we have to start by building those on a microcosm, which is within our own homes. We cannot have strong black institutions without strong black families, strong black communities of black people that are working and striving together. You know, we want equality with whites when we don't even have equality with each other. Okay. So there's a reason why you see so many, I'm just going to be specific, white males, especially your billionaires. They're always married. Even when they get a divorce, they're coming right back with another wife. And that's because our laws, our financial laws in this country are written to promote marriage. They're written to prefer marriage as being the state for adults in America. It's, it's written to strengthen the financial vitality of the marriage institutions. Couples that file jointly in the tax code receive a $24,800 deduction. And this is from 2020, so it, it's probably changed a little bit, but heads of household only receive about $18,650 in tax deduction, okay? The, there's a marriage bonus of $7,399 or 3.7% of the, your adjusted gross income. So these numbers bring the tax liability of a married couple down over just a head of household. There's a lot of different intricate workings of the American tax code. Most people know that. That's the reason why corporations are paying fractions of pennies worth of taxes while the middle class is basically supporting the whole entire country and being taxed to death 
we're not even taxing the rich. Like, that's what AOC said. She wore a dress that said tax the rich. So I say eat the rich, but, you know, semantics. My point is that understanding how marriage functions in generational wealth in response to the tax code is very important for black people. I think some of our really weird views around marriage would change if we understood that part. Um, when you are married, you're able to claim a much higher charitable donation function. And like I said, these things don't even matter until you get into certain tax brackets. Most of us are going to get a tax return. If you get a tax refund every year, none of this pertains to you. Broke people don't care about marriage. And even though it's a good wealth management tool, like I said, just like buying a house, especially when it comes to generational wealth, it's something that we're just not taught. It's something that's just not a part of the way we are socialized. You don't see mothers sitting down with little black boys explaining the finances of life. We don't get taught that in school. We don't get taught that in college. We, we're never, ever taught about tax codes and finances and how to build wealth. That just doesn't come up in anything. We're not taught how to negotiate our wages when we go on jobs. We're, we're not taught about the market value of anything. There are a lot of intricacies to the tax code when it comes to marriage. And people who are up up, up, up in those wealthy areas financially know this. They're taught how to get money and how to keep it. And they understand how important institutions are. That's why you'll see them create a charitable foundation. Well, your marriage is a charitable foundation. It's a place where you can fund money into your partner, especially if you have an unemployed spouse. That person is able to cap out a lot of tax liability for you. I think that and, and oftentimes when black people are approaching marriage partnerships, they're not even considering on any level how this particular union is going to impact generations of people, how it's going to impact the community as a whole when we start looking at wealth dynamics. And like I said, wealth is power. We're going to stay in a powerless, oppressed place as long as we don't start dealing with our morality, you know, our home issues. We can get out here and march and protest. We can do all of the, we don't boycott no more. Like I'm about that boycott. Money is power. Okay. But we can do all that. We can do all that outrage. But until we come home and put families together, until Women who are earning considerable wages are married to the men who are earning considerable wages. If a man gets to a certain tax bracket and then wants to go marry outside of the community, well, that money's not going to get funneled back in. It's like that black dollar that only rotates two times and then goes clean out of the community. One to two times, because let's be honest, it don't always flip twice. Sometimes it's gone as soon as we get it. We write on Amazon, putting Jeff Bezos on the moon. So, you know, most of us aren't supporting black business, black women, black children, black anything. If we really want to hack generational wealth, if we really want to put a dent in it and use our lifetime to make a difference in the trajectory of the black community, we're going to have to get married. We're going to have to make healthy marriage unions. And that has to do not just with the money, not just with the tax code. Like there's a reason they've kept us from getting married. Why it's in the best interest of the powers that be to see black men and black women be the most unmarried group of people in this country. You also have to look at getting therapy, getting off the grid in these social media accounts that are fueling division and competition amongst black men and black women. Like we really have to unplug, be unbothered and get unleashed if we are going to fulfill the potential that was dreamed about for us. You know, we are the dream of the slave. 
And we're becoming more enslaved to the same system that they were trying to escape from. Now, if you are about that exodus life, go ahead and drop me that fire headphones emoji in the comments. Because as always, I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the neighborhood wireless woman. I look forward to connecting with you in the comments. But until the next episode, class is now dismissed. You left a hole in me. Oh, I'm so deep, didn't even bleed.